Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, stability of colloidal dispersions. Okay. Um, so what what do you understand if I say that the colloidal dispersions are stable? Any thoughts? Some some thoughts. So we can think about uh, stability, stability as two two different in two different ways, right? I can uh, I as I mentioned already, I can think about something called as a uh, stability against sedimentation, right? That means I have the same dispersion. If I leave it for a while, everything goes here, right? They all settle down. But but typically, um, I said that such a thing will only happen if you're working with what are called as colloidal. Or suspensions, right? Not okay. Uh, typically, this will happen when you're working with suspensions, where the particles are larger in size, and because you work with very small particles, it is assumed that the gravity doesn't play a role. Okay. However, what could happen is this, right? What you're looking at is two pictures. Uh, picture A, where you have a, a stable colloidal dispersion. I uh, really not define what is stability, but I'm saying that it is stable because all the particles are in their individual state. Okay, they're happy being in the fluid. Okay, however, we know that the because the particles are very very small in size, they have a high surface area, right? Which makes them prone to what is called as aggregation. Okay, again, people use term called aggregation, coagulation okay, and things like that. Okay. So what you have here is an example where you have formed what is called as an aggregate which contains multiple particles. Okay. So why do you think things will go from this state to this state? Or can you think about ways by which things can go from this to this state? Okay, so uh, the answer that I get is that if the interaction between the two particles, okay, is more favorable than the interaction between the particle and the fluid okay yeah so we can think about along those lines now okay we'll again spend a little bit of time talking about um, um, interactions in the next few lectures um, so what will happen is this right so uh, so if you have particles in a fluid um, you know that these particles are not stationary right they are being continuously hit by the solvent molecules in which the particles are dispersed. That means for every particle there are a lot of solvent molecules which are hitting, okay? they are hitting everywhere okay? because of which the particles can move around. Okay? So whenever you take a dispersion okay? and if you say that I have this dispersion at a temperature T, okay. So the energy that the particles have, okay, it is given by what is called as KBT or the thermal energy. Okay, this KB is what is called as a, a Boltzmann constant, okay, which has a value of one point. 38 into 10 power minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Okay, that multiplied by the temperature will give you a unit joules, which is a unit of energy. Right. Therefore, the moment you have any fluid or a colloidal dispersion at some temperature T, 
invariably all the molecules as well as the particles in the fluid have this thermal energy KBT. Okay? Now you can ask a question as to what now I am drawing these particles very far apart, right? They are sufficiently far apart. What can bring the particles close to each other is this thermal energy, right? There are thermal fluctuations, they are moving around. Okay, when they are moving around, they could approach another particle. Okay, when they approach another particle, the particles may either attract or repel. Okay, that depends on the type of the particle that you are trying to deal with. Okay. Now, here is an example, okay, where so what you have is some energy, in this case it is called as a it's interaction energy, okay, or also called as a, a free energy, okay, that is this. And you will see in collage literature that uh, whenever people talk about interaction energy, you always scale with KBT. Okay? Uh, the reason is this, right? When you do interaction energy calculations, uh, I said that the Boltzmann constant is 10 power minus 23, right? Now, if I multiply that by, you know, like say, say if the temperature is 300, right? This energy will be of the order of 10 power minus 21, right? So, when you do calculations, when you get numbers which are 10 power minus 21 joules, so you may say that look you know it's too low you know it's really it's not important okay so just to get a feel for the numbers that you get out of such calculations you typically always scale the interaction energy with thermal energy so that i can compare and say hey the interaction energy that we are ob obtaining it's 1 times kbt 2 times kbt 10 times kbt something like that okay therefore you'll always see that people who do interaction energy calculation they always scale the interaction energy with the thermal energy. So, what, it plot, what is plotted here is this interaction energy okay, as a function of separation distance that is plotted on the x axis. Okay. So, the way to think about this interaction energy is it is the energy with which the particles attract or ripple given whatever distance they are at. Okay. So, if you look at this, let us trace this plot, okay, that is your x axis okay so the interaction energy goes something like that you know right so people typically talk about this minima that you have is what is called as a, a primary minima okay or also called as a global minima okay this is what is called as a, a secondary minima. Okay? Now, what you have here is a, a barrier. Okay? So, in order for the particles to approach and reach this primary minima or the global minima, they have to cross this energy barrier. Okay? Now, if the energy barrier that you have Okay, if it is of the order of KBT, okay, because the particles already have a, a thermal energy and that thermal energy in fact is KBT, if the energy barrier is also of the, of the order of KBT, what can happen is these particles can easily cross the energy barrier and then they can come and reach this global minima state where the, the particles can form aggregates like this. Okay. Now, once the, the particles form such aggregates which are essentially at a very small separation distance, right? This is delta is a separation distance okay, th that corresponds to you know this um, uh, global minima. Okay? So, once they reach that place, they are aggregated, it is very difficult to separate them out. Okay? You can do sonication, of course, it depends on the this again, it depends on how what is this you know the minima is right what is the location of the minima if the location of the minima is really really large that means it is practically impossible to separate these particles once they aggregate however if this you know this minima is of the order of maybe a uh, few times kbt then sonication or anything you know may be able to rip them apart okay so therefore 
So if you have cases where the, the energy scale associated with this, this um, barrier is of the order of thermal energy, such dispersions are said to be what is called as kinetically unstable because the kinetic energy that the particle possesses because of the thermal energy, it is good enough to overcome the barrier and then make it go from this state to this state. Okay? Such you know a process or such a you know case is referred to as a case where you have dispersions which are kinetically unstable. Okay? On the other hand, you could have a case where the, the energy okay, which corresponds to this barrier, it could be much, much larger than kVt. Okay? When I say much, much larger than kVt, it could be you know 100 times kVt or you know several orders of magnitude larger than kVt. Okay? Uh, such dispersions uh, are said to be kinetically stable. Okay, that, that means there is an energy barrier associated with the particles being in a, a dispersed state and a, a destabilized state. Okay. If the height of this energy barrier is of the order of kVt, then the dispersions are kinetically unstable. If the height of this energy barrier is much, much larger than kVt, then such dispersions are kinetically stable. Okay. Um, yeah. So, any any questions with with this? Okay. So now one can ask. Yeah, you have. Yes. Yeah. So for stable colloids also. Um, Everything depends on this energy. Everything depends on this energy, right? So, if I have a, a stable dispersion, okay, I could have. So, again, stability is a very relative term, right? When I say stable, you know, I could have a dispersion of particles, okay, homogeneous dispersion. You know, it may be stable for a day. You know, but if you wait for a few days, you know, things may, you know, coagulate. Okay. So, everything depends on, so what will happen is this, right? So, the particles are moving around because of Brownian motion, they approach each other. Now, if the, um, uh, if, okay, let me put it this way. So, what, what you can do is, I can play with this energy barrier, right? I can play with this energy barrier. Now, say that I have a dispersion where this energy barrier is like say 1.5 kVt. Okay. Now, you could ask a question as to look something where the energy barrier is 1.5 kBT, it is, uh, is it highly stable? No, right, because you know, so of course, if you look at 1, one times kBT and 1 times 1.5 times, they are comparable. Okay. Of course, if I, if I talk about 1 kBT and 100 kBT, there are two orders of magnitude larger. Therefore, definitely such colloids will exhibit a, a better stability. Okay. Um, so, I will come back and answer your question. Before that, I want to talk a little bit about something called as a thermodynamic stability. Okay? So, these are dispersions which exhibit what is called as ultra long stability because, because such colloidal dispersions are formed because of what is called as a, a thermodynamically favored reduction in the the free energy of their formation. Okay? Uh, I talked about the formation of micelles. Right? So, when you start with you know fluid and start adding surfactants, I said that they form micelles. Right? The, the formation of micelle is a process where there is a overall reduction in the, the free energy of the entire system. Therefore, okay, such uh, association colloids in water, they do exhibit uh, ultra long stability. That means, I take a dispersion of micelles, keep it for years and years. You know, if you, if things do not change, if the temperature does not change, if the solution conditions do not change, they continue to exist as micelles. Okay? 
Another example is what is called as a micro emulsions, okay, which are typically formed when you have oil, water, and a surfactant. Um, what you're looking at is uh, some example from our lab. Um, this is a pure diesel, you know, a fuel that people use, right? Um, uh, and then this is a diesel micro emulsion. Uh, this has diesel plus water plus a surfactant called AOT. Okay, you can look at the if you look macroscopically, you don't see anything, right? You know, it is very difficult to say that, look, I have water in there, okay? It has some amount of water and some surfactant, but it looks very transparent, okay? That is because it contains very tiny reverse micelles, okay? So the micelles are, you know, something like that I said, right? Reverse micelle will have water inside and an oil outside and the surfactant molecules are arranged something like this. Now. If I look at the size of the dispersed phase, okay, that is these micelles, reverse micelles in water, in, in oil, you look at the size, right? This is measured as a function of time, 180 days, that's six months, okay? Practically, there's almost no change, okay? However, if you take a, a dispersion of kinetically stable colloids, okay, you could also have a case where, see, there are kinetically stable colloids which are available in the market, which do exhibit a shelf life of years if you, if you want, okay? But however, I can't say that such colloids are infinitely stable or that they are stable forever, okay? It's because, you know, at some point, you know, the, the thermal energy is going to overtake and they're going to aggregate. Uh, so these are the two examples of what are called as uh, thermodynamically stable um, uh, uh, colloids. The other examples of thermodynamically stable colloids are uh, solutions of polymers, okay? I can take water, put a little bit of, you know, polymer like PVA, uh, polyvinyl alcohol, you know, make a solution, you know, keep it for, you know, this is a tip, you know, you don't, you don't see any changes to their size or, you know, aggregates, no aggregation, right? So, uh, uh, final example of uh, um, a thermodynamically stable um, state one could achieve uh, is cases where you work with charge stabilized colloids. Now I said that uh, when I say charge stabilized colloids, you should imagine that I have a dispersion, say the continuous phase is water and your dispersed phase is particles and the particles have some charge, okay? That is a, a charge stabilized dispersion, okay? In such a case, what, what you will have is there is a high, high energy barrier for them to aggregate and they are actually an example of kinetically stable colloids because they have an energy barrier much larger than KBT for their aggregation, okay? However, when you have a large collection of such particles in the fluid, what will happen is they exhibit a crystal state, okay? I was showing you some images the other day, right? So these particles, they, they form uh, what is called a crystalline state where you know they are closely packed periodic arrangement okay and such crystals again are an example of thermodynamically stable states because again their formation leads to reduction in their free energy okay so that's uh, something about uh, the stability so maybe I'll, I'll stop here um, and then we will um, um, uh, look a little bit about um, some properties of uh, coral dispersions in the next class, okay? Yeah, thanks.